So now that we have structs under our belts, I wanted to give uh, a lesson on uh, dynamic arrays um, because these are super useful and I needed to explain what a struct was before I could uh, give the definition. Um, but the natural way to do this to me seemed to be to use a project that uses multiple files and I haven't said anything about that. So first I want to say some things about compiling a project that extends over several files. And this is just the most basic possible stuff that you could say about this. There's some other things that I'm not going to talk about, like uh, extern that I might talk about in some other video in the future. Um, so you can see here, here's my main file, and I'm making reference to this struct, which is actually defined in this other file. Here's the definition. And um, so there's a, a question here about how the compiler, when it's going through this file, is going to know what this means. And how is the compiler going to figure out uh, also what these function calls mean? Because these function calls are, are not defined um, in this file, they're declared, you know, I haven't said anything about this distinction between declaration and definition, but w when you declare something, you say sort of what its syntax is, you know, this function grow, um, oh lord, what did I do? This function grow, it returns an int, and it takes a pointer to the struct type as input. That's sort of its, that's what it, how it operates syntactically then you actually have to define what grow does. So there's a difference between a declaration and a definition. The de this is the declaration. The definition is in this file. I don't know if you can see this, but um, th there are two files here. The only difference between their names is that one ends in .h and the other one ends in .c. And when you make um, something like uh, a data type that you want to reuse in several other projects, this is the way you usually do it. You make a header file, which is a .h file, and then you make a source file, which is a .c file. And in the header file, you put all of the declarations, and in the c file, you put all the definitions. Um, you can get away with putting definitions in the header file, but it's not good style. Um, so the connection between the header and the source is that the header is included and because these things are are sharing a local directory I use the quotes instead of the brackets and you have to do that or you'll get a syntax error there is a way to move once you have a, a, a program that you really like if you want to move your header file and your source code and sort of install it in your machine um, you can you can put everything in, in directories such that you can use these sharp brackets and then you can do your include from anywhere on your system and not have to worry about things being in the same folder and stuff which is great but for and that the details of how to do that are explained in head first C which I think some of the people listening to this video have um, but for now I'm just gonna do the the quotes and remember what that does is at pre-processing time the compiler comes through and just pastes the content of uh, this file right here. And because it does that, you have to be a little bit careful in the in, in helping the compiler do the pre-processing because suppose you have a header file that includes another header file that includes the current header file, you get a vicious cycle of infinite pasting. It's uh, you can actually make it happen. Just make a, a header called A and include another header called B and in, inside B include A and it'll go on forever and the compiler will get to some um, maximum you know number of, of iterations of this and then it'll give up and tell you that there's a problem. So what you have to do to stop uh, these things from being from those stop those vicious cycles from occurring and uh, to stop this stuff from being paste it in when, you know, superfluously when it's already been pasted in once, you do uh, this little ritual. So you have to make up some kind of identifier to be associated with uh, these this this code. So I'm calling this D array. And uh, so this is if not defined, then define D array. 
and now here's the definition and now at the end I have to put in diff so you should always do that in a header file you know that can be just like the first thing that you do when you write a header file and now I have all the declarations I've got my um, I'll explain the details next time but the important thing is that the the declarations are in here and the associated definitions are in there now I want you to observe that in this file there is no main so the function, the, the code has no entry point here. That, uh, you know, that every program is exactly one main. And the idea here is that we want uh, the functional part of the program, the main routine, to be defined in this file, but have all this, uh, all these methods and structs and stuff defined in, in some other files. Um, so uh, we've done that, and this is a perfect example of the kind of situation where you would want to do that because I'm going to use an, a, an, a dynamic array in this program but I don't want to intertwine that code with the things that I'm doing that are specific to this particular project because dynamic arrays are really general and I might want to reuse that in some other code that I write so it's a lot more convenient to just be able to move the header and the source into whatever folder where I want to use a dynamic array and um, there was a couple other things that I just wanted to show off here. Um, oh, how do you compile the damn thing is a, is a good thing to know. So the, the real um, answer to that in full generality is that you use a make file, but uh, I'm not going to talk about make files here. This is just a fast and uh, quick way to do it. So the main uh, file is in, is in this folder and uh, all the, the source code that I need is over here. So what you can do is just write both of those on the same line uh, for GCC and now it's produced an executable and I can run the executable now when when you get more files involved it can get more complicated and so you might want kind of finer control over this stuff one thing that you can do is you can you can produce object code so the dash C option means uh, compile it, but don't produce the executable. So when it compiles it, it's just going to make this uh, machine code. And let me show you what comes out. So I don't have to type uh, more than necessary. I'm just going to add the dash C option here. And I shouldn't have put that space there. Now let's look at the last two things that were produced in this folder. And you see that there are these two .o files. So this is called object code, and it's uh, pretty close to being just the machine code that defines the program. We can actually look at this a little bit more closely with uh, this object dump program. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do object dump. I like the Intel assembler syntax, and this means that I want source. I think this makes the formatting look the nicest. And I'm going to look at what came out and inside. I'm basically going to open up this .o file, which is object code. And the object code is for this file, the one where main is defined. So let's see what kind of stuff is in there. Um, so there's only one function defined in that file, which is main. And if you look through here, you can kind of figure out what's happening. I think the easiest way to orient yourself is to look at the numerical constants. Um, so here's a 2 and um, so here's a 2 down here in the assembler and it's putting it into this register and then it's making some kind of uh, call. Now um, these calls that occur throughout the assembler code are the calls that are being made to these functions inside the main, uh, inside the main source code. And look over here at the, the bytecode equivalent of these uh, assembly code statements. Notice that the, the opcode for this call is E8, but E8 is always followed by four empty bytes. Here are four empty bytes. Here's another call, and um, this one is probably to this print function, I would guess. And um, so there's E8, and then there's four empty bytes. Now we get down into this more regular sort of stuff where there's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and these other calls. And you can kind of follow along and see what's going on here in the assembler code. Here's the 0, here's the 1, 
here's the two, etc. So all these blocks are kind of similar. What happens at the end of all of them is a call is made to this function, which we know is the append function. But uh, the exact address of where the append function is defined is left blank. That's why these all say 0, 0, 0. That's a detail that's going to be fi uh, fi filled in later at the linking stage of the compilation process. So that's basically what linking does, is it plugs in these missing numbers so that the call to the append function um, gets called to the right place in actual computer memory. And um, so how do you, how do you, let's say that you have the .o files, how do you do the linking? Well, you just do gcc star.o, will it fill that in? Those are my only two object files, but I will actually write everything out here. And dArray.o, and I want to link that with uh, this other .o file. Now that produces the executable. And there it is, it's a.out. And... Um, so one thing that you could you could use this for is let's say you're you're teaching a class and you want to give your students the solution to a project but you don't want them to see the source code then what you could do is give them the header and the .o file then they could compile the solution but they wouldn't be able to see the C source they would only be able to see the assembler code so I might I might do that one issue though would be that some people are running 32-bit machines um, but I think there's a, a way to make this stuff come out 32-bit. In fact, I've been playing around with that a little bit. What is it, like M32 or something like that? And then if you do that, then the, the code that gets produced, um, you can tell that it's all 32-bit because there's no more reference to registers that start with A. They all start with E. So a person with a 32-bit machine should be able to compile or to link that and... Um, and get it to run. And so that's all I wanted to say in this video.